Hello, I'm Paulus. Hello, and I'm Emily. And this is Up Your Arts. The podcast that explores how the arts can enrich your life. <laughs> or not. We're not actually sure whether it... No. 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 It's a, like a hypothesis that we're going to discuss. Yes. And in 45 minutes' time, we, we might have changed our minds, I suppose. Why yeah, we? we might have done. Or we might have just um, had a nice discussion and have no idea what we were just talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Uh, we should tell you that there's two other people in the room with us, I think. Um, Keith is our, is our sound man, our techie. He's our uh, guru. No, no, no. It's Keith in the back. Hi, Keith. How's the laugh? Or is that laughing music in the background? Oh, okay, cool. Nice, nice. And we have a guest who we'll introduce you to in a little while. We won't tell you who they are now, but they're very special to, to Both their family. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are. They are special to us. Yeah. So, Emily, what's going on? Um, I'm sat in a room and I'm sat in your kitchen, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and it's sunny. It's sunny for January, isn't it? Yes, and we've heard Harley, the cat walking by. Yeah, so. you're gonna, you might hear cat noises in the background, people. So I came to you about uh, three, four months ago, and I said, what about a podcast about the cabaret and burlesque scene? Originally, that was my suggestion, yeah. wasn't it? Because I'd looked up on Apple Podcasts or whatever the app is, and I saw that there wasn't any podcasts that were discussing cabaret. Yes, uh, yeah, exactly. And then two appeared, and we listened to them, and we thought we might not do that format. <laughs> well, what I thought was really interesting was I suggested it to you, and you were like, mm, I don't know, uh, a podcast, uh, I don't know. And then two rival, potential rival ones appeared yeah. online. You were like, S then you were all over it. Like, <laughs> it's like, like, We've got sure. to do one now. <laughs> and I learned a lot about you that day. <laughs> um, tell people how we know each other. Um, so oh, we met many, many years ago but um more recently it is uh, through luscious cabaret we work together on that yeah, yeah so i'm currently the uh host of luscious cabaret which is a monthly burlesque and cabaret show in london and emily is it the producer <laughs> is that your job apparently oh i'm sorry i misunderstood <laughs> i thought you were the tea lady <laughs> yes i do sort of like turn up <laughs> Point a little bit and then give people hugs as they come in. That's very important. Yeah, no, actually, you're brilliant. Yeah. You are brilliant. I, I think the first time I met you was as a stage manager. We, we call them stage kittens sometimes in burlesque. I we? hate that term. Do you hate it? Oh, oh I this is news to me. Okay. I just feel it sounds really derogatory. Uh, to kittens? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> Well, I mean, it's just like, oh, you're cute, and you come on stage, and oh. yeah, I, I just, feel, I just don't like the connotation, I suppose, and yeah, so this is literally the first time I've been told this. <laughs> so I've been saying this for years in front of you and many, many other people. Okay. Yes, yeah, you don't see Stormina's face when you say stage kit. Oh, that, that's our stage person, <laughs> Stormina. Okay. <coughs> so I'm, I think people should know if they haven't met me that I'm not very woke. Mm. I'm 45 <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I'm still alive, but that's about it. I've, I've not really dragged myself into 2020 yet yeah. or the 2000s well, in general. Yeah, <laughs> what am I supposed to call you then? Well, right, like now, ever? No, oh, a stage, a oh, stage, stage hand? I just, yeah, what? It's a stage manager. I, I'm like, I, I think you call it by its name, stage manager. In my defence, yeah. uh, I, I probably caught this from Dusty Limits. I'm just going to blame Dusty Limits, <laughs> who's another cabaret host. Oh, I know, a lot of people say, and it's just me, it's it's literally just me who can't stand it. You and Stormina. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so she So that's two people. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I think she uh, doesn't like it because I don't like it. So. All right, so if people can, if people that are listening have got other suggestions, so because I think stage manager just sounds a bit, I don't know, a bit like they're wearing a really long brown coat and uh, have a little roll up sticking out the side of their mouths <laughs> and, uh, and are quite jobs worthy. I've just insulted every stage manager <laughs> in the UK. Like, this is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, just, I, I, do you work with stage managers from like the 1920s <laughs> or something? Is this, is this... Yeah, uh, I will only work with historical figures. <laughs> right. In fact, I was working with Anne Boleyn yesterday. Um, <laughs> I just think it doesn't sound glamorous. And I think when I first heard the phrase stage kitten from Dusty, from another uh, host, I just thought, oh, that's cute. That's kooky. And it's just a bit unusual. And that's why I adopted it. But mm. I get that it can be thought of as derogatory. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm going to try and think of something else. Okay. Okay. 
(laughs) And I'd I'd like to apologise now to Uh, the nation. (laughs) Yes. Let's see what happens at the next Luscious Cabaret on the 7th. (laughs) It's going to be a whole thing. There'll be a 20-minute monologue. (laughs) One of the acts will have to be cancelled because I go on for too long, which is what I'm doing now. Actually, there is only one... There is one less... um, uh, act this month anyway so yeah you can you can Talk have a 20 minute break <laughs> yeah, you can have well, that might be the only time I say that <laughs> okay so I think this is a nice segue into meeting <laughs> our, our guest, guest. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah because and, and we're right on time for that as well five minutes you see so, yeah. there is a plan it's just nobody's not sure what, what it is. is yet no so yes please welcome our guest the gorgeous Michael Twaits who also used to uh, host at Lush's Cabaret many, many years ago. Many, many years ago. It's about <laughs> six weeks ago, isn't it? <laughs> it's just over a year ago now. Yeah. Yeah. How long were you um, the resident host of Lush's for Emily, Michael, before I took over? Like her own life. <laughs> <laughs> Probably two years? Yeah. 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 It was, yeah. Yeah. Because we were, uh, we're in our fourth year at the Albany, so it was the okay. first yeah. two years that you were out, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's a monthly show, and it's a sort of m- mixed variety bill. Even though um, there is you, Emily, of course, uh, is known for her burlesque uh, classes and workshops and stuff. But these days, there's um, stand up comics and uh, musical acts and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, what's that like, Michael, having a, a residency um, on a monthly basis uh, as opposed to one off gigs? I always enjoy residencies because it makes life a lot easier. You know what you're doing, you know the stage, you know the setup. You just turn up and you do it. <laughs> I never like turning up at a new venue when you kind of like, so where do I stand? How does your microphone work? Or even worse, you turn up at a one off gig and then they're like, Oh, you need a microphone. We didn't know. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. The venues that think they can program cabaret and they can, they just don't have any of the equipment to support it. They're yeah. my favourites. Yeah, <laughs> they're great, aren't they? Um, I was talking to my friend Nicola, who isn't in show business. Um, uh, she was just talking to me about what I do, and we might have had a couple of drinks. Um, and uh, she, I was just trying to explain to her what it's like doing this job. And uh, being a freelancer, in general, I suppose this would go for most people. Um, I said, well, you know when you start a new job and you don't know where the building is because you've only just been for an interview and you've forgotten all about that day um, because it was months ago. So you've got to find the place. You don't know where to park. And then when you get there, you don't know how the lifts work or you don't know how to sign in or you don't know where the loos are. You don't know where the storage cupboard is, where they keep all the extra paper and things like that. And you have to, you know, make nice with a bunch of new people for Mm -hmm. the first time. And you don't know what the what the format is for lunchtime and where do people sit or does everyone go to Subway or what is it and all of that. I said that when you're a freelancer, well, in my experience as a freelance performer, when you do your gig here, a gig there, and you may never go back to them, that's your entire life. Yeah. And that's before you've started the actual work. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And that's, I think that's why I enjoy residencies, but also hosting a residency because when you're a guest on a residency, if the host actually does their job off stage as well and welcomes you and lets you know what's going on, it's really useful. <laughs> yeah. And so many people don't seem to realise that. Yeah. Just letting you know there's 12 acts, there's one mirror, you're the first here, go. <laughs> it's you know just useful tidbits. Yeah. Did you used to do that? Because I literally don't do any of those things since I've taken over the last <laughs> <show>. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Was that part of my job? No, it's fine. You sit in the corner. It's all right. Yeah. I've created this backstage. I've created this this sort of fortress <laughs> for my makeup and costume. And the guests but... aren't allowed to make eye contact. With you. <laughs> Ideally, not. No, because they would turn to stone. Obviously. <laughs> Michael, why don't you tell us a little bit about your creative life? How's this all happened? Um, who knows? Um, so I am a cabaret artist and an actor when the work comes in. Um, I went to drama school like most performers and was was doing all right for a few years. Did quite a lot of theatre stuff, a couple of bits and pieces of telly and film. But the f- main thing I did, the first show I wrote, had a drag cabaret bit in it. And then the venue said, oh, why don't you go down the road and promote it at a cabaret venue as well to get some more bums on seats. And then that show took off and did really well, did a tour and basically got me established on the cabaret scene. And then when the cabaret show finished, 
um, the venues kept going, oh, do you want to come and do another slot? And I was like, well, why would I? I haven't got a show to promote. <laughs> <laughs> then they were like, oh, was there's, there a there's money. Oh, there's <laughs> money. Like, oh. ah. You know, yeah. and at the time, like most jobbing actors, I was working in a call centre. Um, so I thought, oh, work in a call centre or wear the costumes that I've got and go out and make some money. So yeah. it was an easy decision. And, you know, a couple of years later, <laughs> here I am. And yeah, I, I mean, I love working in the freelance varied arts where you do get, there's no monotony. Yeah. But the start of it, when you first graduate and then you're sort of trying to find your feet is a nightmare. But then once you're through that and you're in the bit where, which hopefully we're all in now, well, you're getting work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you may be not going, you know, to Hawaii every other week for a couple of days filming, but, you know, you're getting work and you're making a living. Um, I really enjoy the fact that no two days are the same, no two weeks are the same. Um, I was I was thinking about that the other day, actually, that the word, um, what's the word that everybody uses on Facebook, all of, our, all of the performer colleagues uh, uh, use? It's the... Um, Oh, what's that word of like the trying the hustle? Everybody uses the word the hustle. hustle. The hustle is real, or the hustle. I'm yeah. very I'm tired of the hustle. I mm. think it gets you get to a certain point of the year when everyone's just like, oh god, yeah. I'm just <laughs> you know they're sick of asking for work and being ignored or applying for things. And, yeah, and I think there's I, I don't know about you, but I see people on Facebook who are quite the, the, they seem to be serial posters of potential work. I never see this work materialize. <laughs> you know, I think they just like people wanting to wanting mm. them and wanting to work for them. Yeah. And I, and and, it's the, and it seems to be the same people again and again. And I'm thinking, I have literally written to you 17 times this year, mate. If you haven't kept a note of the people <laughs> yeah. that have said hello in the past, then where's your filing system at? You yeah, know? I, I mean, I understand if there's something niche you need to put a casting out for on Facebook. Mm. But if you're a producer and you don't have contacts that can fill the slots you're producing, you're not really a producer. <laughs> 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 oh, that's true. I do have, um, I put an application um, link on the website now, um, just so people can get in touch and I file them all away in one, um, uh, what's the word? Folder. Yeah. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Tricky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is a it's, Sunday, it by is the Sunday, way. It is Sunday, yeah. Everyone's, the Sunday it's just turned noon. <laughs> yeah. And we're all a bit like, everyone's a li got a little bit of a cold. Everyone's a little bit like, what? <laughs> January, what? <Yeah. laughs> um, but yeah, you, kinda, you have to kind of keep up with what people are doing. But um, yeah, the application link just solved so many problems with people just sending one-line emails of like, give me a job. And it's like, but what do you do? Mm. <laughs> So, um, oh, so yeah. they literally wouldn't tell you what they do. They just, yeah. hello, I want to be in a showbiz. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. My when they, oh, no. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Would you like to carry on speaking? I was just going to say also when people apply for work and they don't know what they're applying for. <laughs> and they'll say something like, so when is it? Where's the venue? And it's like, well, you came to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you not know? It's like applying to Harrods. <laughs> and where will I be working? <laughs> well, I was going to say, um, you mentioned drag earlier on and drama school. And uh, I think it would be fair to say that we're, we're slightly different uh, ages, you and I. I might be a little bit older than you. Well, I'm still in my early, mid, late 20s. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Um, and... I think we might have gone to the same drama school, we did. actually, um, which I'm not going to mention because I hate it. Um, but when I went to drama school, when I'd left drama school, it was very, very rare. So this was 25 years ago that I went to drama school. Uh, it was really rare to meet a drag queen on the drag circuit in London who had drama school training. Mm -hmm. I was one of very, very few at the time. And I, my question is, I'm guessing that's changed. <laughs> Yes and no. I mean, I found that when I first graduated, I was very much kind of pushing myself as an actor. And I would always use actor first, even when I was in full drag. It was just that cabaret and drag was the role I was playing at the moment, almost. Because in my long-term plan, acting was always going to be the, the kind of spine, the backbone of what I was doing. And there was a very big difference, and there still is, between acts who are working the scene and have their residencies but the drag scene is quite a small niche market with I don't want to say limited venues but a classic drag act works you know in the 
sort of Soho London area, there's maybe eight kind of traditional drag venues. Mm. And I don't think you get many acts in there that have the drama school background. But drag itself and cabaret itself, since I've graduated anyway, has really become popular and fashionable and everyone wants a bit of it now. And having experience outside of traditional cabaret bars is actually very useful. Being able to be approached by theatres or be approached by hotels, different venues, and be able to kind of mould yourself. Whereas a traditional, I've only ever worked in cabaret, cabaret bars, and sing, I am what I am, I will survive, (laughs) and tell jokes about women and adjust my bra. That's one ilk of drag. I call that the cock and kebab jokes, sort of <laughs> well, cabaret, yeah, I mean, drag world. It's kind of traditional end of the pier is how I politely <laughs> yeah, refer to sweet. it. That's really sweet. That's um, really and, it, you know, there's, and it's not that I'm against it either. I enjoy it when I'm in that mindset. Yeah. But, for example, I um, worked for New Year's. I worked at the Shard and programmed three floors of entertainment for a very different clientele. And I had to find drag acts, cabaret, performers, bands that worked f- for that environment and that wasn't going to be the end of the pier mm. types. It was people that have experience of the flexibility of what some stages need. Do you think that says something about the changing uh, attitudes of... Um, I-, I was just about to say the changing attitudes of homosexuality because I just link drag and homosexuality yeah. automatically and I don't know how linked they actually are anymore. But again, as an old man of 45... I, you know, when I first started doing drag, and you know, until maybe five years ago, I would never encounter somebody who did drag that wasn't also gay or what would now be called queer, mm. yeah. whether they be a drag king or a drag queen. Yeah. But I would ne- I would not assume this now. No. <laughs> the landscape has like exploded; it's changed mm. so much recently. And I guess I, I and I wonder if there's something because I mean, you you work on big stages. You int- mm. introduced Renee Zellweger recently on a on a big platform in yeah. drag, didn't my you? My close personal friend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I wonder what that says about how how we homosexuals <laughs> feel about ourselves and how mm. the, the the wider world uh, think about us that we don't just have to be in the corner of a pub telling those jokes about women and adjusting our bra and, you know, the kebab jokes. Do you know what I mean? I do. I do. Very much so. And I also very much link drag with being gay or queer, however you want to phrase your sexuality. But the... And I think that is because in many ways, drag is a... You can't look at a man or a woman and say, you're gay for certain. (laughs) But if you see someone who is clearly dressing up and being flamboyant, in gender opposing their own, there's something that instantly makes you go, that's someone queer. And it's it's sort of a visual symbol of their queerness. They're not passing. I hate that word, but you know what I mean? They're not, <laughs> they're not pretending to be a... You know, if people... I mean, I get it in everyday life because I'm a dad. Um, and since having my son, I find I'm going back 15 years and I'm outing myself again every single day because people see me with my son on my own, just the two of us. And the clues to society are, I'm a dad, he's a son, and therefore there's a mother somewhere. Mm. So they just think I'm a camp dad, not a gay dad. So I have to kind of almost out myself, again, at Mummy and Me groups, and it will always be me that's here. I'm going to be the one that comes. My husband is at work, so you can talk to me. I'm not one of these dads who's just covering while mum's sick. Um, (laughs) But it's almost like the opposite of that. It's... Like, the drag is a way of just visualising the queerness rather than just looking, another horrible word, normal. (laughs) (laughs) So, in because you teach the art of drag as well, Mm -hmm. so have you seen a kind of change since you started teaching the art of drag of the uh, types of um, people who are doing the course? Yes. <laughs> what doing? Yeah, doing. doing. <laughs> Participating <laughs> in. Participating. I don't know. Yeah. So the but course. I mean, the course hasn't really changed in structure. It's ten weeks. They do one night a week, and it's always been open to all. There's no criteria for auditioning. It's just first come, first serve, book in. Um, and the first two times we ran it, it didn't have an awful lot of momentum. I guess you know there were. People had booked in to do it. People did the showcase. 
but the, there were spaces left on the course and the showcase was just a nice night. And then from the third course onwards, it's been sold out and then the showcase has sold out. And I think as a result of those two things, the acts afterwards have also pushed themselves further to continue their work because they felt there was momentum from, oh, I got a space on the course and then we did our showcase and it was sold out. And <coughs> so I think there's a lot more now who see it as a realistic way of getting into the business yeah. or, or starting in the business at least. But there's also, there's a lot, when I when I first started doing it, I was worried it was going to be people that wanted to do RuPaul's Drag Race. Mm. And then by week three, we'd just be like, Michael, when's RuPaul getting here? <laughs> um, but actually... Okay. Like you were some sort of ambassador for yes. RuPaul. Like. <laughs> because it, for a lot of people, that is their main reference for drag. Mm. Um, and considering you ran a course called The Art of Drag and you're a drag performer yourself, you're not actually all about... You, you're not very keen. On no, the I mean whole I shade and or the other words you said you didn't like earlier on. You mentioned a couple. Oh, just, I, there's <laughs> there's a whole passing. I've got a you whole don't like the word passing. No, I don't like the word yeah. passing <laughs> because it implies I'm in. When you talk about passing in drag, it, it's like you're trying to trick people, mm. and I'm in no way trying to trick people. Well, it, it, it infers something fake to me anyway, yeah. and I and I don't feel fake when I'm in drag. I feel more authentic a lot of the time yeah. in drag than I, I do mean, the rest people, of the time. People often sort of will say to me after a show, oh, you're tall, aren't you? And I'm like, well, I've been on stage for a couple of hours and you've been looking at me. <laughs> and it's only now when you see me up close that you're thinking I'm tall. And what I assume that means is that they're looking at me in my feminine guise and proportionately everything I'm doing is working. And therefore they've put me in a box of, well, he looks you know, lady bits look about that ride and that, so therefore they assume my height must be a certain height and then, so they've bought into the illusion that I'm selling that maybe they didn't believe I was a woman, but they believed I looked like proportionally what they were expecting a woman to be. Mm. Um, and I find that quite odd because I am six foot three without any heels or wig. <laughs> um, and for the last few years I've been using coloured hair rather than you know, so I have pinks and purples and blue. I don't really... I've got blonde, but um, I like to do things that make it clear that this is drag. It's uh, so curious, the, the, the idea that you're, you know, uh, in civvies, as you will, your height is remarkable, but when you're in drag, it isn't. It sort of gets balanced out by everything else about yeah, the look. exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's very strange. <laughs> Um, but no, I, I do love the Drag Race show. Um, I, I think it's done amazing things for representation. For RuPaul. LGBT. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just say that. I'm sure she <laughs> listens to this in one of her many holiday homes. Um, no, she is phenomenal. I think she's done brilliant things and it's a great show. I also think there are huge problems with it and it's monopoly on drag in TV world. And anything that has a drag queen associated with it instantly gets compared to RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, programs that perhaps would have been commissioned aren't being commissioned because of RuPaul's Drag Race. Mm. And it's it feels almost like people are ticking a box of, no, we've got our one drag show that will be on this network. Thank you very much. Yeah, we used to have, uh, you know, we used to have John Inman on Are You Being Served? And mm. people would think they weren't homophobic. <laughs> but I like yeah. John Inman. Oh, yeah. Good. Well, then we're sorted. Peter Tatchell can stop. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I think for me, anyway, I. The thing I find interesting with drag is that I don't describe myself as a drag queen and then expect that to answer people's questions of what I do. Mm. I think it's one asset of what I do. I'm a host and I'm a performer and I'm a raconteur and sometime attempted singer um but i'm not a i don't say i'm a drag queen as if that makes sense of what i do i use drag to do what i do if that makes sense you know if if you said to someone oh what do you do for a living they say i wear suits <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. doesn't tell me enough i want to no know. accountant has ever said that to me and yet every accountant does yeah, wear a suit exactly. that i meet anyway but yeah. it's just because i do i use drag 
that isn't the full answer to what I do. And I think that's what, in a way, drag race is doing. People now are assuming because you do, you wear drag or you do drag, that you will tick the boxes of that show. Um, which I'd be very interested to see what happened if I did go on it. I think I'd have a riot. <laughs> um, and then when I had to lip sync for my life, I'd be like, could you hand me a microphone, please? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't do it. I'd refuse to lip sync. Yeah. I'd also refuse to make a costume. I mean, I'd be terrible <laughs> on that program. Yeah. I would I just mean, be sitting in a corner going, no, I'm sorry. Yes, it's not acceptable. When they say, you've got four hours to make a costume. I'm like, I only need 30 seconds. Where's my designer's number? Exactly. Hello? <laughs> eBay. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's, the show is what it is. And it's really great that they did a UK version. And I think it brought some interesting stuff. And there were some friends on it and I was very pleased with them and then there were other people on it and I was like, oh, interesting. Mm. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Fair enough. Would you like to see one of your students uh, do RuPaul's? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I really would. I really would. And I think there's a, there's definitely a few that fit the, the mould well enough but are quirky enough as well to be chosen. Yeah. So the course is called The Art of Drag. Yeah. And this podcast that we've, uh, for some reason, uh, cobbled <laughs> together um, is supposed to be exploring um, what how the arts can enrich our lives. So uh, I wonder if we can bore down into the fact mm -hmm. that you've chosen to call your course The Art of Drag. Because I think, if I'm very honest, when, I'm, when I first saw your course advertised, I was a little, <laughs> considering I've been doing drag for 20 years myself, I was a little shocked. Yeah. to hear to see the title and and it, and it gave me pause it made me think oh is there an art to this <laughs> <laughs> and have i been doing yeah. it <laughs> um well i think it's about threefold the reason for the name um firstly it's there's a lot of cabaret and a lot of drag which isn't rehearsed mm. it's a lot of i've thought of this i've rehearsed it in my bedroom and i've got a costume right and then they the performer goes out and either expects to earn money from it or enters competitions where they get judged quite harshly publicly. And they're not things that I think one should be doing. I think you should get some feedback before you show it to people and get feedback from people who do know what they're talking about um, so that you can create something that is art rather than a one-off fluke of, you know, especially with acts who are talking and doing comedy stuff quite often after the first run through, they're like, oh, now I get what my act is. I need to do it again. Yeah. Um, because rehearsing it without an audience, rehearsing it without people giving you feedback is a completely different experience. Um, but the other reason for the art is because we, as a course, it's split into two halves. And for the first half, we're looking at all the different things you might do when you're in drag. So we do a kind of character comedy week, an alternative modern drag lip synky type week. Um, and then we have a drag king come in and we do parody week. So we have different guests each week who come in and talk about their specialism. Not saying you're going to do all of these things, but saying this is the canon that you can draw on for drag. Now, where do you want to fit within that? Um, so it's not, I didn't want the course to be how to be a drag queen or how to be a drag act because I feel it just limits. So calling it the art of drag was quite open to mm. interpretation. Mm. Yeah. And also it takes the pressure off at the end that you don't need to identify your piece as being drag if you don't want to. We're looking at the skills that drag artists use. Yes. And now you're creating a piece of work. Yeah. And that's great. And the logic is it will be a drag piece. But we've had some what I call traditional cabaret singers who've come in who before the course were park and bark, you know, just stand by the microphone, <laughs> sing beautifully <laughs> and then walk off the stage. Yeah did the course, aren't now presenting as drag, but are using some of those trips and ticks and, you know, just kind of flirting with the audience a bit more, breaking the fourth wall, adding just a few lines to introduce and get out of a song that just make the whole experience richer and better. 
and this mix them what, and act. This is exactly what I come across with my training courses for cabaret singers, is people saying to me, but I'm not a cabaret singer. And I, well, that, that doesn't mean that there isn't something that you can learn from this yeah. and take into your work as a jazz singer or mm -hmm. a vocalist or a session singer or whatever it might be. And, and it, I'm glad to say that very slowly over the years, I am getting those types of people coming to the courses now, but it took quite a long time. First of all, it took me quite a long time to get my head around the fact that it it could offer, and I did offer, um, things for people other than cabaret performers. Yeah. And then you, and then of course you sort of readjust your marketing and and your pitch uh, so that uh, so that that makes people feel that they can apply or, or yeah. at least you know inquire about it. But that took me quite a long time to realise. Oh no, there's something here that you can use even if you're a stand up comic. You could come yeah. on this yeah. course and learn about. No fourth wall. I mean, I don't know how many stand-up comments know about the phrase no fourth wall. Probably all of yeah. them, but maybe they don't. I, well, don't I mean, if you come and see a, a kind of mixed bill stand-up comedy night, then the craft of the comedy is always great, but I can't remember the last time I went to a comedy night and I saw any comedian using costume in any way to add mm. to their set. Yeah. And that's, in many ways, all that a drag act, when they do comedy, is doing. The drag somehow builds or adds to the comedy yeah a friend of mine's a comedian and she added in a bit of burlesque we met a, a burlesque course and she added an extra bit of glitter put like had her hair up in a beehive instead of having that standard stand-up comedian look of jeans yeah. and uh, t-shirt and um, so she added that extra bit of sparkle to it even though it wasn't a burlesque comedy act mm -hmm. it was just adding in a little bit of sparkle to yeah. Correct. Yeah. So I went to this thing recently, um, uh, organised by a very, very um, useful and helpful chap called Simon Kane, and he does this thing called a festival meetup. So um, he arranges for um, festivals from all around the country, comedy festivals and fringe festivals. A representative from each of them comes um, to a location at a certain date, and then other people come along. And I think you, uh, there's a donation of a fiver to come along. Basically, there was a room about this size of. 15 different representatives from 15 festivals all happening at different months in the coming year that you could ask questions and find out whether your show might fit and what the mm -hmm. you know uh, application was and they all said to a man they all said we just want anything that isn't a white bloke in a t-shirt yeah. yeah. <laughs> a white straight bloke in a t-shirt so I was like I, I went and, and said oh I'm creating this show about Victoria Wood there's a pianist it's a two-hander we're both gay and they were just like yes when can you come but yes <laughs> yeah. but and and, and it, that was very interesting yeah um on that note yes. I think we need to segue into something else oh, <laughs> yes. oh, I wanted to ask Michael a question um go no, on ask, 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 ask the question we've got oh. we're fine go on. so you said earlier on Michael <laughs> that there was a long-term plan of acting yes how's that Working out for them. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> She's available for hire. No, um, the, what I, interestingly, I think some of my best work, and by best I mean my highest profile and best paid um, work for acting has now come off the back of my cabaret work. So uh -huh. a lot of casting directors, when they get a breakdown for a drag queen, are just like, we're not going to get a man and get him to dress up. Let's just find a drag queen that can act. And that's been my foot in the door with a lot of stuff that I've had recently. Oh, cool. um, and yeah, I think acting is something that I will never sort of take off my CV, even if it's been 15 years that I haven't done a theatre show or whatever. It hasn't been. I'm very busy. Um, <laughs> but it's, do you know what I mean? It's one of those things that you're, at the moment, I'm in very cabaret heavy mode and that's great. But, I don't know if I can see myself in my early mid late fifties still popping a wig on and heels and all of that when you've got bad ankles and all of the joys of growing old. <laughs> um, but I could see myself being like, oh, a lovely season of Chekhov somewhere. Oh, I can, <laughs> I'll be the camp old waiter, lovely. <laughs> but you you are very busy and you're and you're getting quite well known now. And uh, does it matter that you know the long term plan and the acting may at least temporarily have have, have been sidelined and that oh, you're not at all doing no anything. and i think i think it's fine to um just see where the journey goes rather than always having a route but i'm a bit business savvy i guess so i'm just making sure that people understand that i am an actor at all times because 
sometimes I do these silly high profile things with pride like when I got to introduce Ronnie Zellweger at Trafalgar Square and that got picked up by loads of little blogs and magazines and the other day she won a Golden Globe and I was getting tagged in things on Twitter and Instagram and I was like we met once <laughs> did and you win the Golden Globe? well I went on to her. collect it for <laughs> People were criticising the accent, but I thought I did very well. <laughs> but, um, she, um, but it's that weird thing of you never know what will just get you on someone's radar and so on. So, you know, I've got my agent, I've got Spotlight, and as and when the stuff comes in, we'll see where I go next. I'm sorry, Emily, you wanted to move us on somewhere. Well, yes. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, should we? We've got... No, uh, we can keep talking. Okay. We can, there was a plan. But there maybe was a plan. plan. Shall we see where... Um, I think we've missed section four. That's section gone. four is gone. <laughs> gone. So yeah. I, I, I'm not sure that we've actually discussed the arts enough. <laughs> <laughs> so do you know what, actually, I really want to ask is, do you have stories, Michael, um, uh, from your students about... I guess the word uh, that I like to use is is the byproducts that the arts can uh, give us. Mm. So someone has come on a training course with you or with somebody else, or they've done violin for 10 years as a child. They haven't become a violinist or they've come on your course, but they haven't decided to do drag. But do you have stories, and I'm hoping that they're good, good news <laughs> stories, but maybe they're not, about how that's changed their lives for the better, but not necessarily them becoming an artiste do you know what i mean i do i do um we have this course yeah this sort of round of the course will be well 100 students will have done the course so across that we've had people from i would say almost every walk of the lgbt plus life um and straight people oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, wow. quite a few straight did you have to people. get new toilets <laughs> Yeah, we had to put signs up saying you can use this if you're male. <laughs> um, yeah, we had, um, we've had all sorts of people, but the there's kind of maybe three schools of people that come. There's the ones that actually want to be drag acts in one way or another. Then there are people who are, in essence, looking for a fun club to join that's a step up from book club. <laughs> you know? So we meet some new people. With no reading involved. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Meet some new people, exploring the interest that they all have. You know, we do rehearse above a bar. Um, so we have a couple of drinks. Yeah. And it's a social outlet. And at the end of it, they get up on stage in front of their mates and they have one great night. And sometimes they think, well, I'll do that again. But quite often they're like, no, that's all I wanted. I've loved it. And, you know, I'll do it for my friends at the office Christmas party, but I'm not going anywhere with this. Yeah, no, uh, burlesque course, we have similar and sort of um, uh, mix of people. That, yeah. yeah, they want to, they just want to come along and see what burlesque is about. Mm. Um, like one course I had um, two girls who'd never seen a burlesque show before. Wow. <laughs> and, um, and they the came first, on a course. And they came on the course and the wow. first burlesque show they saw was after they'd finished their course and after they'd done their showcase. <laughs> well, actually, the first question I ask on the first day of any course I run for cabaret for singers or any or any course like that is, okay, uh, I, I get out a flip chart. There, there's usually quite a lot of brainstorming and mind yeah. mapping at the beginning of the day. And the question is, what is cabaret? <laughs> Nobody has an answer for that. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> knows the answer. And, and then you ask, them, well, how many have you seen? And again, there's not that many hands go yeah. up. You know. And so then I go, oh, well, let's name some famous cabaret performers. Like, you know, world famous on, like the, you can go to Mexico and say this name and they'll have heard them. No, I mean sometimes sometimes they rock out Bette Midler or Liza Minnelli, but you know that's yeah. about that's yeah. about the extent of it. Yeah. You know? And you've paid to. I mean, that, I, I yeah. guess that's why you're here. So yeah. great, but <laughs> but yes, I mean they do seem to, um, people who come along without any experience um, of burlesque or um, on my course anyway, um, they seem to be the ones who get the most out of it because they didn't know what this world was about beforehand. Yeah. And once they were in it, they're like, oh, yeah, I want to see more. Uh, either they'll do more or they'll go start going out to see more cabaret and um, more burlesque nights. So it kind of works in that sense that even though they might not be going on to become performers, they've actually found something um, that in a community or something that they enjoy. So they go out and see more live theatre. I mean, I assume this is more burlesque heavy, but yeah. I mean, there may well be uh, stories that you have, Michael, uh, from, from your own experience too with the art of drag. But I wonder, Em, if you know, I mean, 
you probably don't want to say any names, but are there people whose uh, personal lives or their body, um, their own body image or body issues have changed for the better because they've come and learned about burlesque or fan dancing or just given people confidence? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, a few, uh, <laughs> I had this wonderful student when I first started, she did the course three times and it was after the um, third showcase she did. She went, I really enjoyed that. That was amazing. And I was like, you haven't for the past two <laughs> courses. <laughs> and that was the last course she did. And that was the last uh, performance she did. Cause mm. I think she knew the way. I was... love the idea that there's someone out there. <laughs> uh, I will go on a course and I will go on it until it's fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I will start doesn't matter how many times <laughs> I have to do this. <laughs> Once I'm there, that's it. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely. And, um, I bumped into her a few years later and um, she quit the job that she'd hated. And um, she told me that at the time she'd been going through um, some counselling as well. And how even her, when she told finally told her counsellor that she was doing the burlesque, they were like, oh, I could, that's why things have changed. They'd, made an, they'd noticed that her confidence had changed and what she was talking about in their sessions had changed as well. And what does that afford us in the drag world, from your experience, Michael, for people being able to put on... Uh, do you like the word mask? No. Yeah. <laughs> or put on think, another persona? I think we release the mask. Uh, you know, okay. I think it's, you know, it's a bit more... Um, so this is the mask. Yeah. The civvies is the mask. With sort of conforming to society. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I saw one of... I saw a meme the other day about how queer people, as you're kind of growing up, you get so much sort of put upon you by society and then you come out and you decide, yeah, so that is who I am. And then you have to spend the rest of your life unpicking. So when I was a child and that happened, I've accepted that. But was that because that's how I wanted to be? Or is that because that's what society put on me? Yeah. And you spend the rest of your life unpicking it. In a way, drag is a way of just sort of chucking all of that out and just performing the exact opposite of what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and I think for the students on the course, we've had, you know, quite a significant amount of them are... I say quite as significant. Every course, I would say, there has been someone who is gender questioning or exploring kind of being gender non-conforming. Um, there's a couple of performers who did the course who are who have since come out as trans and are living very different lives. Um, and the course, I don't want to say... They did the course and they transitioned. Yeah, they, they've. Um, I can do that for you too. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, I think coming into an environment where people are so open-minded and you can talk and you can explore within parameters and sort of release a lot of stuff, especially for the younger people coming into it, they might never have been in an environment where people have talked so openly about a lot of things. And, yeah, so that's obviously a huge change for some people i guess there's a permission that some people get given by you know coming to a training course uh learning a new skill and learning a whole bunch of new people yeah Meet, sorry meeting a whole bunch of new people uh, and it gives you permission to to be someone else or do something else or just be a different way I don't know. Yeah. yeah and it's you know we always start on the first day going around and introducing and doing all those things that you do and over the last few years, the pronouns thing has got much murkier. Right. Um, so I quite quickly sort of say, I'm Michael, and I just don't really give a shit. I'm he or she, it's fine. Yeah. Um, so for, you know, for anyone that, listening that doesn't really understand what that means, Michael, can you explain it to <laughs> us? Um, gender soup. Um, no, <laughs> each mouthful's different. It's, you don't... Um, so obviously the majority of us grew up um, in our own gender, um, so you were born, the doctor looked and said, it's a girl, it's a boy. And then you've lived that life. Um, and therefore they use those pronouns. But some people don't agree with the gender they were assigned at birth. Some people don't feel that is them. Some people don't believe in the binary of gender. And then some people are literally sort of releasing their real gender because they feel they were assigned the wrong gender at birth. Um, so... It's a real minefield of words that you're not supposed to use anymore. Mm. And I try in the room to sort of say, we are going to make mistakes. I am going to use the wrong pronoun to you at some point. Yeah. But it's not because I'm, I don't care. 
about you is because I really don't care about gender. Um, and half the time when I'm dealing with what you might call a traditional drag act, one of my male friends who I've worked with for a long time will often call each other she. And that's camp. And mm. that's funny. But then if you do I that, called you Mrs. Twaits when you were... Well, right. exactly. And I didn't, it didn't even register. It's not a thing. For me, because I'm very secure in my gender, I've got a willy. I'm very happy with it. I just in case dress, one and I get paid. <laughs> But the, you see, this is curious, isn't it? Because uh, you and I both don't care. Yeah. And and our, you know, in the cabaret scene, this is quite old fashioned. Yeah. And and and, and some people might say oh, almost, you know, dinosaur like. Um, uh, but we do have to care, don't we, uh, about other people's because we introduce yes. people for a exactly. living. Yeah. So you've asked me backstage, yeah. what, what, how do you want me to introduce you? And I said, I couldn't care a damn. My yeah. dad, it doesn't matter at all. And I think I went through a phase where I thought I was supposed to care, or I think it was like, or try and say they, but it doesn't really matter. But uh, it's, uh, it really, again, it doesn't matter to but me either. But there's, you know, if you host something like Luscious Cabaret, there are potentially up to 10 other people. And these days, it is a big deal to go around to each of them and say, What's the preferred yeah. pronoun? Yeah. yeah. But I almost feel a little bit sick in my mouth just saying it. And it's, I don't know why I'm so it, I've against also, it. I also find it hard because on the course anyway, we I get to know the performers and their acts. And obviously with drag, people are often changing their personal gender for the act. And I'd quite often previously refer to performing against your gender because if you're male, you become a drag queen and you're becoming a female looking ish performer or vice versa if you're female and you become a king you're kind of playing against yourself but if you are gender non-conforming um or if you're trans or any of the other umbrella of queer terms that people gender fluidity that they want to use you've got to be careful not to exclude which obviously we're not because it's an inclusive course and more and more it's becoming the, the lines of gender and performance are getting blurred, which is great. But uh, I have to work at making sure I'm getting that attitude of, I don't care, not because I don't care that you care, mm. but in the room, we should be friendly enough with each other that if I make a mistake, you can tell me, or if I make a mistake, I'll correct myself. Yeah. Um, one of the performers has changed their name, um, their personal name, during the time I've known them. And then I called them their dead name, their former name, in a room that they went in, and they were in the room next door, and I just went in after it. I was like, I called you your old bollocksing name again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, that's how I want to be about it. I want yeah. to be as camp and silly about it as I am about everything else. Yeah. And that's... I know RuPaul gets into a lot of shtick about their sort of excluding any other drag that isn't men dressing up. Um, because you have um, people who have come on your courses who work now as drag queens who are women. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They don't. They don't become drag kings. No. They, they. They. They are drag. Queens, we have kings. But they are queens, women. Queers. Just people some are born. straight. Yeah. Some are gay. Yeah. Some are queer. Yeah. Exactly. You never quite know. And and with some acts, it's important to know. I think. Um, for myself, I quite often will walk on stage and say, I'm a man in a dress. I've heard yeah. you say that a lot. Yeah. yeah. Cause it's, it gets... I say I'm a drunk when I go. But, it, it gets... <laughs> but then the audience know where they are. Yeah, we know where we're at. Uh, right? yeah. Yeah. Whereas if they come on stage, I don't want someone looking at me for 25 minutes being like, hmm, maybe she's trans, maybe she's this, maybe. It's Unless like... that is what you want them to do for 25 yeah. so minutes. So personally for me, I yeah. don't want that. Yeah. I want them to know exactly where we are and then come with it. Mm. Um, but I think audiences like that, though. They like having a boundary mm. as well, because then they can get into your act instead of, like like you say, spending 25 minutes like, yeah. thinking about something else. And then when you're the compare, it's your job to sort of, it's a bit like running a kindergarten, isn't it? You know, you, you create <laughs> a, a boundaries and you set up some rules and you go, and, yeah. and, 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 and here I am, I'm going to introduce people and you know, try if you might get in the microwave. microwave. <laughs> I've thrown <laughs> away from it, but you can't, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it's, yeah. it's that weird thing as well with when I started hosting I was hosting with Finger in the Pie Cabaret and we had all sorts of variety acts and I remember one act all I had on their call sheet was that they were a bed of nails act and then she turned up late and was getting ready and I just said right I've got your name is there anything I should say or shouldn't say and she was like oh no it's all fine and I was like great 
It's all evening. I was building up that there was going to be a bed of nails at. And then I went backstage. She was like, it's meant to be a surprise. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. After you'd introduced. <laughs> yeah. after, oh, no. So I, I told them what was going to happen, and it was meant to be a surprise. And, I mean, it was their fault for not telling me that yeah. when I asked. Yeah. But in a way with drag, I, I asked the questions, of, do you want them to know what's mm. going on? Or do you want them to not know? Yeah. Because it's quite, well, it's quite key to what you're doing in many ways. And on that note, we've been talking for a long time. <laughs> I feel like the, the plan's really... I mean, it, the, it, the plan went out the window ages ago. A long time ago, ago yeah. Have yeah. we failed <laughs> podcasting on our first attempt? Yes. You I, said you weren't going to edit. You're going to be hours yeah, in the episode. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can we blame our guest choice? I think we might blame this on Mrs. Twig. Yeah, I talked yeah. about it. Is that all right? Yeah. yeah. Edit me down to 12 minutes. <laughs> it was supposed to be like games and this moment here and five minutes of this. It's all gone to shit. It's all, but... So and I wasn't supposed to be swearing either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I started the swearing. Oh, yeah, you did. So See, you again, did. it's, it's yeah. the guest choice. But we did make a note that we would scrap a couple of p- p- sections if our guest was very interesting. And there you go. You win. You yeah, win. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a compliment. Oh, okay, I'll, ta- I'll take it as a compliment. Emily never says nice things about me. So <laughs> we have I it on do. tape. So Don't edit that out. <laughs> I'm sure I have at least once. No, I'm going to turn what you just said into my ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a thing? Can I do that? Yeah, Is that a, a yeah. potential real You'd thing? You'd need to be a technology person. <laughs> I'm not quite how to do it. <laughs> Keith can do it for us. <laughs> it's like they're doing thing. nothing else. Can you make some ringtones for us, Keith, while we're <laughs> prattling on? <laughs> um, I suppose on that note, we should really kind of wrap up because oh. we were. it's been um, 50 minutes. Oh no. Yeah. Well, 50 minutes of my life under the game. <laughs> <laughs> Are we supposed to plug things we're doing at this yes. point? Yes. So, first to Michael, is there anything that you would like to plug? Oh, that you're um, doing? Uh, you yeah. are always. No. Um, so, The Art of Drag is always ongoing. It's booked up until like September 2052 at the moment, but there is more courses after that if you want to come and be an old age pensioner in drag. Um, and then I am now producing Pride's Got Talent, which I've hosted for many oh, a year. Um, but I'm producing now... it as well. Yeah, oh, yeah. So I'm officially I'm the head of Pride's Got Talent. Oh, um, it's so exciting! So it means business. <laughs> and, you, and if it gets into financial trouble, can you potentially go to jail? No, or... no. Okay, <laughs> no. Oh, I've signed all the right papers. <laughs> um, basically, I'm doing everything I was already doing, but now I've actually got a job title that Ooh. says it, um, and that's kicking okay. off. I think we're open for applications on the 20th of January. And then in April, we're doing all our heats as usual. And then running all the way to a glittering West End finale, followed by Pride in Trafalgar Square. Amazing. Oh, and how can people um, find you online, Michael, if I they're interested in you? In everything, I am Michael Twaits, because no one else has that name. No one else wants it. <laughs> <laughs> and when I'm shouting at people in bars, I have to say that it's Michael. And then do you know the singer Tom Waits? T wait. Oh, that's good. <laughs> to, that's quite a lot of stuff to shout across a bar. Well, I mean, you know when you're in a bar and they've got the music up too loud and you don't want to ruin your voice because you're about to go on stage and you've been paid to sing. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> one of those. You've made it sound like you're northern now, that Michael Twaits. Twaits. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, no. if you don't explain how it's spelt, you get H's and E's thrown in for no apparent Thwaites. reason. Thwaites. Michael Thwaites. Thwaites, yeah. Um, or you get people being like, Twats. Michael Twats. <laughs> Which some people do think is why I'm called Michael Twaits, because I think it's a clever drag. <laughs> they think it's your drag name. Yeah. They think <laughs> it's and then, in no. fact, I was drunk with some friends. No, I wasn't drunk. Um, I was you chatting never. with some cabaret performers. <laughs> Mary. Day, and we were talking about this, and they were like, oh, and then there's an eye in the middle. It's like, I can make you feel like twats. And I was like, mm, okay. <laughs> I think they might have overthought that. A yeah. Little. yeah. <laughs> Emily, what are you doing at the moment? Um, oh, I'm starting um, dropping classes next on the 21st of January. For <laughs> cookery? <laughs> For Flower burlesque. Range. Oh, burlesque. Yes, okay, lovely. I've got some burlesque dropping yeah. classes, so just pop in and uh, have fun with an hour, uh, hour with feathers. And the, the brand is uh, a similar name to Luscious it's, Cabaret. Yes, it, well, it's, Lush, um, it's burlesque classes with Luscious Cabaret. Oh, okay. So, okay. so just look up the Luscious Cabaret website and the classes are all there. The courses are starting in February. 
And um, of course, ne the next Luscious Cabaret is the 7th of February. Do you have men do your training courses? Yes, I do. Last time I had more male than female really? on the course. Yeah. So it's not a different course for fellas? No, um, I've done mixed classes. Um, so they learn exactly the same thing, like taking off a stocking or whatever yeah. it is, yeah? Yeah, and so if they want to wear heels, they can wear heels. If they don't, they don't have to. And same with the women, actually, because uh, I've had many women come and go, I cannot stand heels. And like, okay, fine. You can do it without heels. It's all right. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I, I can't remember what I was going to say. But what are you doing for? <laughs> oh, um, I'm working on a new show, which I'm hoping to take to the Edinburgh Festival. It's uh, oh, based on Victoria Wood. And uh, I'm really shocked because um, I was working in pantomime in Ipswich in December and the dancers, the wonderful dancers that I were working with uh, are all 19, 20 years old and none of them had heard of Victoria Wood because Stop she died, it. well, she died four years ago. So they were like 15 then um, and they didn't know who I was talking about. I can't believe there are adults in the UK that don't know who Victoria Wood is. No derision, my decision. I'd rather watch the spinners on the television. It's really, uh, I'm in it's shock. quite, a, yeah. I mean, is that, did they also not know who Prince was or who um, Alan Rickman was? Because they died in the same year as They'll know Alan Rickman because of Harry Potter. Potter. Because of Harry Potter, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But um, my show is called Looking for My Friend, the music of Victoria Wood. And it's myself and a piano player proving that what many of you have known from decades, that it takes two men to do the job of one woman <laughs> half as well. And so my first preview for that is on February the 11th in oh. South London. So I'm busy with that at the moment. Exciting. Lovely. And Keith, what are you what are you working on at the moment? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> working on his tan in the corner. Nice. <laughs> Thank you for coming to see us, Michael Twait. Thank you very much for having me. It's been lovely. And we'll see you next time. On Up Your Arts. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>